that guy in that old shirt Who must be the fence expert Who's that guy in that old Operations and expenses It's time, it's really time To elevate small businesses It's time, but Joe had dropped His knowledge is relentless This rhyme of mine Is getting a bit ridiculous And here we go We're live with Joe We're the show What is up, Fitz fam? So good to be back with you guys again Appreciate you guys tuning in On another Saturday Ask the Experts live Q&A, coming to you live from the Expert State and Steel Studios. Ashley and Caleb, thank you so much. I appreciate your guys' continued support. Guys, I appreciate you tuning in, whether you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, or if you're listening to this on a recorded podcast. If you are, this is a recorded version of a live Q&A we host most every Saturday uh, starting at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. If you'd like to watch live and have your comments answered in near real time, uh, tune in. We'd love to see you. Like I said, either on YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you guys to, well, two guys that probably don't need an introduction in the fencing world. If you've been in the fencing industry for more than like a day, you know each one of these guys. Let's bring them up. Say hello. Gentlemen, how are hey, you? Hey, guys. What's up, everybody? You guys doing well? We're good. We're good. I, I need to find an orange version of Mark's shirt. I need to do this. This is good. You need to probably try some other colors out. It's good. I like orange too. Trust me. I like orange. I, 
I tried other colors and they just don't feel right. Like something's just well, I'll <laughs> so I do occasionally wear other colors like for family photos um, because my wife is not totally on board with orange. Like she feels like we need to wear other colors, which she'll come around. Um, but yeah, <laughs> and like on family vacations, no Ozark fence, no any of this. Um, luckily, I had a couple guys in the fencing community give, send me shirts that are orange with their logos on it. So last year we got around the rule a little bit. I have a feeling this year there might be more uh, more stipulations. Anyway, guys, today the subject is driving aluminum or driving post for aluminum fence. Um, and listen, I understand everyone in the fence community probably watches multiple channels, right? So if you did, you got a preview of this conversation on Wednesday uh, with uh, with I was almost said Dana Can with Dan Blanc. The so yeah, so you got a little preview there. If you guys don't follow. The other podcasts, whether it be, you know, My Fence Life or the Fence Entry Podcast, you definitely should, or The Successful Contractor, right? So uh, you guys should check those out. Uh, links, if you're watching this on YouTube, all these channels are linked uh, on the, what's the tab called, Braden, where you link your friends' YouTube channels? What, what's the tab called where you link your friends' YouTube channels? I don't know. There's a tab on the, on the YouTube page where it's like, anyway, so... You can find all these channels there. But gentlemen, so uh, the tab, yeah. yeah, the channels. Okay. So let's talk about driving driving aluminum post. First and foremost, so I saw this comment come up this morning. Can you drive the aluminum posts themselves? Yes. If they're thick enough, probably. No, just did it today. Or uh, no, Mark did it on a video today, I saw. Mm, yeah, you I did. Drove, I did yeah. You drove it. I didn't say you could build the fence and they use that method. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You fair use enough. the pounder, string right pounder, yeah. right, pull the post. Fair enough. Fair enough. So what what ends up happening? I've done I've done these tests, and what ends up happening is is that if you run into really hard ground, it'll actually when you pull that post out, it'll actually blow the whole end of the post out and separate it, and it's it's not a great idea. It's so they're just too light, and you'll damage the top and scratch the tops. And so yep. so the, the question was, can you? Yes. Should you? No. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Well, even when you're driving. You know, thick wall steel, you still get a little bit of mushroom at the top, right? You still end up having to cut the top. If, if you're in rocky soil, you have to cut the top. Well, the problem with doing that on aluminum fence is it has pre-punched holes, right? So you really can't afford to cut off that top. You really need to leave it. So thus, the eye post, which is what our collective solution to the problem is. Which actually, it's Mark's solution, and then he brought us. He was nice enough to bring us in on it. Uh, Mark, why don't you describe the eye post a little bit, if for those that may not have heard of it? So traditionally, the problem is, well, wherever there's a solution, there's the there was initially a problem. And the problem was is that traditional aluminum fence is built post panel, post panel, and that's because it needs to be inserted between the posts. And once the posts are set, you have no way of getting the panel in there. And if you were to drive it. Um, then you would mushroom the top like we were talking about. And since it's pre-punched, you can't just trim the top because now your hole's off and everything looks weird. And, um, so that leaves you to where you basically have to install post panel, post panel. And so I, I, I hate to even bring this up, but we are in a Wyoming, we're a wet set area. And so we wet set everything and it was incredibly yeah. hard, very, very difficult. Yeah post panel and assemble everything and have it stay straight and true and Dang so it. that leaves you to dry packing which means that you're getting concrete all over your fence and that concrete dust is all over everything um you've got a big mess in the backyard now because you've got the dirt plus you either have to yep. be very very careful with your concrete or wash it off and so the eye post um to be clear i didn't come up with this idea this was sure. developed by a guy named steve dalton and he came to us one day and said, hey, I've got this great idea and I've got it patented, but I really don't know how to get it to market. And that's when I said, hey, I think I kind of know how to do this. So why don't I just buy it from you? And so we basically bought his patent to be able to sell this system and use this system. And that's when I approached the two of you and said, hey, uh, this is kind of a risky proposition. I'd like to lower my risk a little bit. <laughs> sure, so, sure, yeah. So if it doesn't work out, uh, and it's a lot of money, you know, it's a lot of yep. money we paid for it because it's a, it's a big idea and I think it's going to grow. But um, yep. it, it is the perfect solution because it allows us to overcome all those obstacles that we had. Now we can set all of our posts. 
we could sleeve the aluminum over it. We have infinite height adjustment. So let's say we put a post in and they had done some excavation there and we didn't know it, it goes in great. And you come back a year later and that post is settled. Well, guess what? We just go back and we raise that post a little bit and make it look good and, and it's easy peasy. Um, we don't have the concrete to deal with anymore. So we're not packing concrete into the backyards, which saves our guys. Uh, well, and the trash we associated. Have, yeah, all the trash associated. We don't have the concrete dust. We don't have the dirt. Um, you know, so maybe the, you know, that the next question is going to be is, is, well, what do you do with utilities? Like somehow we don't have to deal with utilities if we dig the hole. Yeah, the same so thing you were doing problem, digging. Our utility problem just got a lot less because normally we're doing a, you know, six to 10 inch hole. And we, we're, we're disturbing this much soil, and so we need to be two feet off that line, which means we actually need to be two and a half feet off the line to the center yeah. of the fence. Yep. Well, guess what? When I'm only disturbing this much area, I have a much less chance of hitting a utility or staying further away from it so that I can stay outside that two foot zone. Yep. And the same, same rule applies. Probe for it, pothole it, figure out where the utility really is. But utilities are a problem. It doesn't matter if you're pounding or digging. You're yeah. far better so. off pounding with utilities uh, in, in reference to the space, the cubic amount of dirt you're disturbing. An eight inch mm -hmm. hole is eight, about 800% more soil with an increased chance of hitting the line anywhere in that soil you're removing than the inch and three quarter by three quarter boat. Well, absolutely. There's a couple more. So in my mind, there's a couple more benefits to one being repairability. Right. So we had a customer come in earlier this week wanting to get just a panel. But I looked at it, I said, this looks like an aluminum fence. Yes, it's not a steel fence. They're like, well, we don't know. So I zoomed in on the pictures. Like, no, there's a hole punch in the post. This is an aluminum. I don't know the fence style itself, but I know this is an aluminum fence. So you're going to need to have a post also and pull it out of the ground. So, well, it's installed in concrete. Yeah, it should be. So, uh, you know, if it's more than, you know, a few years old before we started pushing driven posts, yeah, it probably should be. So you're going to have to pull out the post. You're going to have to re, you got to get a new post insert. And so I'll walk them through the process. Like, well, that now I have to hire a contractor to do that. That's not something I could do myself. Well, that probably true. So repairability would be a key thing here too. So, mm -hmm. you know, this, so what happened is a tree had, we had a lot of windstorms lately. A tree had fallen or a limb had fallen in the middle of this section, only damaged the panel, didn't damage the post. So in this scenario, one of those posts could be unfastened, lifted up, the panel could be removed, new panel inserted, reestablished, and rescrewed in, sort of thing. So I just I did the math real quick. An eight inch hole is 50 square inches, just a little over 50 square inches. A two by two post is four square inches. So you are 12 and a half times, you're disturbing 12 and a half times as much I, ground. So you have I 12 said and a half times. I was off by yeah. a little bit, but it's yeah, a lot. 12 and a half times it's more likely to hit that utility. Yeah. So absolutely, and well, if, that's, if you that's gotta, the at the end of the day, you got to dig a hole. You got to dig a hole, like or two holes. You got to dig two holes. Yeah, a normal job is thirty holes, right? So you either dig all thirty because you don't know about this iPost thing going to work. What happens with the utility? Or you have to dig two holes. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. what are we talking so, about? Well, and also on the subject of digging holes, and I wish I could find this paper now. There's a research paper I'd seen years ago talking about when you dig a hole. I mean, when you look, when you think about your augers, there's always teeth that face out. Right. So mm -hmm. as you're digging this hole, you're also disturbing the surrounding soil. You're uncompacting it, decompacting it. You're lessening the compaction of the soil around the hole. You're so even if you, you're disturbing the earth is what's happening. Right. right. So yeah. even if you set in concrete, you still have less compaction in the soil around that hole, which probably is why you see settling or when it gets wet, you see these posts move. Uh, with driven posts, you actually add compaction slightly, not probably not measurably, but you do add compaction to the soil around it as well. So we actually uh, pulled one out yesterday. Uh, we drove one in the wrong spot. It was really cool. This is another benefit of having the system. We, I mean, it wasn't necessarily the wrong spot. What happened was we were just working around the yard with a couple of crazy angles and property lines we're dealing with, and we drove the pole where we thought it was best in line. But as we measured back from the other side, if we had moved it, the angle just a little bit, all of it would have been full panels. So 
how easy was it to pull that post out? Well, it wasn't easy. I used a quick pull and it took a lot of force to get it out. It was amazing how much force to get out. But we got it out. The dirt was inside the channels of the uh, eye post. As a matter of fact, when we, we went to lift it, it looked like we were pulling a dead body out of the ground because literally the whole earth around the post was heaving as we pulled it out. But that dirt in those channels was rock hard inside that eye post. Rock hard. Interesting. It's so, you know, a compaction, we're shoving it in there, and that dirt inside that, that eye post was compacted tremendously. Now, we just pulled it up, moved it over a few inches, drove it back down. I mean, you couldn't even tell we even moved it in the yard. It's amazing. Well, yeah. I mean, one, once the grass pops back up around that where it was driven, you'll never see that ever again. That's uh, very similar to the same thing we see when we do the Postmasters because they've got that unique design, you know. But it that soil gets inside all of those nooks and crannies and actually just creates a ton more friction, more so than with the round post. You get a lot of friction with the round post. I've driven round posts and clay and actually broke chains pulling them out. Yeah. Uh, we did that in Iowa. I was out working on an airport in Iowa and we had to pull some posts up because they got knocked down too high. And we actually broke a train, like a quarter inch chain, trying to pull that out. So it's not like there's this misconception through the industry and we're terrible about it because people will see something new and they think, well, you're just trying to cut a corner, but they don't realize that what we're doing, what all this information about driven fences is nothing new. There's right. nothing new about it. I was in Nevada looking at a, the site, one of the sites that we're um, looking at some work at, they were doing some solar work next to it. And I don't know if anybody's watched a solar farm get built. It's all driven. Every single, every single one of those support posts for all those solar panels, Every single one of them, they had eight drivers out there knocking posts in all day long. Yeah. All day long. And those are very expensive solar panels. So if it's good enough for them and they have enough faith to, one would think, <laughs> yeah. one would think, well, not somebody's only, done some engineering on this. Well, not only expensive, but they're incredibly heavy and they act like sales. So you also get a lot of wind pressure on it. So it's mm -hmm. not only that hey, let's protect some expensive equipment. But like you said, there's been engineering involved that says it can withstand wind load. It can hold the weight of these panels up. Um, yeah, the entire solar industry has been using driving methods for years now. There's a guy here in town. They travel all over the country. He's got like 20 of these the drivers, and all they do is drive solar piles everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's to your point, it's nothing new. Well, Look at the agricultural industry. I mean, they've been driving posts for how long? And for they've been laughing at us for years. <laughs> well, the no, but, <laughs> and then no, they, they haven't. You can't even get close. you can't even get the ag industry to agree because one person <laughs> will say, "Hey, driven post, we drive everything," and you'll go to Texas, and I think the Texas people. I'm gonna I'm gonna say the Texas and Oklahoma people are probably some of the worst when it comes to the ag side, but they'll be like, oh, I can't believe that you don't, you don't concrete your pipe. They don't understand that <laughs> we're trading circumference for depth a lot of times too, right? So that's what we don't talk about. You can't just put it in the ground two feet and call it good. And that's what my latest video was. It's like, how, how do I determine how deep I need to go and make sure that my fence is going to be secure? You know, do those tests in your own area. So it probably just shows like who I follow in the egg industry. Like all the guys I follow are the the Luke Gibsons, the Ryan Sloops, and those guys. But yeah, so that not a shock that fencers in any sector of the industry we're, would disagree. We're never gonna agree on everything anyway, <laughs> right? It's not gonna happen. So <laughs> but the other thing to consider here is strength, uh flexibility. Flexible is stronger than rigid, right? Up until the point when rigid breaks. So when we, we had a uh, first time ever, we had aluminum fence blow over, a five foot tall aluminum fence blow over. It was only in the ground for two weeks and it was dry packed. Wind, high winds, 120 mile hour winds blew one line of fence completely over. Wow. We went to do the repair. Uh, the dry pack concrete was hard. It was crazy. I don't know why it happened in two weeks, but it was hard. But all the posts were broke exactly at the top of the concrete. I, mean, yep. I took the you know, right at the top of the concrete right which was about four to five inches below grade they all broke right there mm -hmm. now we've done some testing with the eye post ourselves with a uh, crane scale when you pull on that post that load there's no one infinite point that all the load is at one spot to kink the post it's bowing over a large 16 18 inches maybe even more than your soil and as it bows bows that load is being distributed through that entire sector of posts 
So it's, it's infinitely stronger at that moment. If you put that load in one little bitty spot, you're going to have uh, intensified that load. And you're going to have failure at that point. But the advantage of it being flexible alone allows that thing. And that flexibility is coming from the fact that the earth is giving a little bit with it. The post is giving with it. It's arching through there. And we're not finite in that, that uh, load to one little spot for failure. Not to yeah. mention, Mark has proven you can just bend it right back up at the end of the day. Even yeah. if it does tweak a little bit, it's not ruined. Sure. Well, that's in the in the video we had put out. So we did a reaction video of one of Mark's uh, iPost videos. And in citing it in, it was like two posts, I think, were a little out. <laughs> Mark just pulled his entire weight against it, brings it back to plumb. Perfect. Done. Yeah. So it also adds a little bit of adjustability to it as well. We had some guys yesterday for the first time ever see the system, and they were very skeptical of it. Uh, truth be told, they really didn't want me to, to, to show it to them because they didn't believe in it that much. But, but <clears throat> there was multiple guys pushing and pulling this fence to make it perfectly straight after the install. They were blown away at how much effort it took. Sometimes two guys is what it can take to move a post just – just a quarter inch, three eighths of an inch. It's a lot of effort. The thumbnail of the of that video is me yanking on that thing, and it's <laughs> no joke. Like it takes everything you have at four feet to try and bend some of those posts. It's a I, lot of effort. I do that a, with a standard post, and you'll snap it off with zero effort. I did a flag stand uh, hold yesterday on one. So we set a pole, and they're like, "Well, is it strong enough to hang on the gate?" So I did a flag stand pole <laughs> off of one of the posts that didn't move. I couldn't. I was even shocked. I'm like, "Damn." <laughs> Didn't see no. how that was out. I think we had a question about something like Sorry. that. So th this was like that. It was that exact, well, not that exact question, but that was the theme yeah. of the question. Can you hang from it? Can you hang yes. from it? So um, to make the gates even stiffer, what I've been doing is driving the eye post and then driving the aluminum post, not full depth, but uh, intentionally deeper. And it stiffens the gate posts up even more, but now I'm really compacting that. So I'll drive the gate posts another 18, 20 inches. You know, if you're using a thicker wall gate post, yeah. you, can, you can almost get the full 24 inches in the ground with the thumper and a protector. As long as you have the eye post in there first, it just follows right on down next to it. And it just stiffens it up even more. Nice. Nice. So you mentioned the thumper so let's talk about like where where the product and associated products are available right so that's that's the question i see a lot is where do we get the products um so right now the products are available on swi side is that right mark yeah so just to try and keep everything so we're shipping everything so that everybody's aware it actually ships out of florida you'll probably think it's coming out of wyoming it's coming out of florida that's where everything is. And that's because that's where one of the largest on the eastern side of the U.S. is the largest aluminum market. Um, so it just puts it a little bit closer to you. And we're doing the best we can to try and make those ship friendly. Yeah. Um, our site, uh, we've, we've had to work very hard to try and make sure that it'll populate a freight price. And sometimes when it goes over a certain weight, it bumps you into a category outside of UPS. Um, you may still get it UPS if that's the fastest. Um, so it's it's kind of a catch-22, and we're doing the best we can to try and alleviate all that. But my my word of advice to anybody that's looking at ordering these is the more you can order if you're a fence company and you're really buying into the system, the more you can order, the more you'll save. If you can well, buy full bundles, you'll save a ton. Oh, sure. Well, and, and I think we see that on any other type of fencing also, right? You know, a, a truckload of pipe is cheaper per foot of pipe than a bundle of pipe. A truckload of wire, cheaper than a pallet of wire by the foot. It's going to be the same thing. By the unit, it's cheaper but to buy in bulk. But the shipping is drastically cheaper. Yeah. Not yeah. just the cost of the unit. So you, well, we sent five bundles up to me, and it was 50 cents a post. That's nothing. Right. I'm talking about combined combined cost of the unit. You know, if, yeah. if – yeah. Anytime you're shipping multiples, you're spreading that delivery cost over more product. Not to mention, if you buy in full units, you can buy a license and you'll save the cost of the license in the first full unit. Plus, you're saving all that shipping. So if you're going to do this system and you're going to make the switch, make the commitment and go all yeah. in. And I, you'll I save a ton more money. 
<laughs> you're not going to save a lot of money by just buying 10, 20 posts at a time. No. Shipping cross country. Like that's not going to get you. You got to take the same leap of faith that I took, that Mark took and Joe took in this whole thing. We took a big leap of faith to do this. And I think that those out there that have done it so far have been blown away. Every, every, every demonstration I have done at the end of it, the, the people that are there watching it are absolutely speechless. Hundred percent committed, right? The so. people that are the people that are buying in small quantities, I would say, are the people that want to do their own fence. That's the people that should be probably buying ten or twenty and and doing their own thing. Fence contractors, if you're an aluminum fence builder, you'll go through a bundle of these. We can go through a bundle of these in a month, maybe, maybe it lasts us a month, but typically not. Yeah, and probably not. No. Probably so not. as far as the other tools, though, we find yeah. a SpaceX tool for us game changer. Um, Yep. usability and and you know so some of the concerns if you get over the hump of uh people believing okay i know drive driven post works great but how do i get them drove exactly accurate in the right spot yep. with guys that are not seasoned drivers like that's a good okay fair sure. question you're right right so we have simplified that by have made a jig that has notches in it that literally directs that post exactly where it needs to go we can get them within an eighth of an inch i mean to where it's tab to tab perfect yep. uh, using mm-hmm. the spacex tool and then the next problem with the aluminum fence just so happens that we can solve it with the same tool and that's cutting sections or remainder in sections and and equal distancing those things a lot of math i mean just yesterday i watched a guy who's been building the fence for three years miscut the last panel he did not use the spacex i was on the other side of the yard he wanted to do it his mm-hmm. own way and he cut the panel four inches short. And I'm walking over like, what are you doing? I just showed you guys how to use this tool. It takes a dumb out of it. Well, I was just going to do it my way. Well, how did that work out? Because we don't have any <laughs> panels here today, right? <laughs> so, you know, we, we got it. There's a tool that this literally takes a dumb out of it and will make the remainder at each end perfectly spaced. It just shows you where to drive the post. So you're not even nibbling the rail. You're just cutting a picket off. And it goes, we can customize a section in length in less than one minute. That's mm-hmm. not from boom one minute and it's installed and so at that point all you're doing is plumbing the post yeah. right just making sure it mm-hmm. stays plumb uh, both directions yeah don't get me yeah. wrong make sure right plumbing, but yeah but it but it's spaced post. it goes exactly in where you're wanting it to go yeah and then it, it our jake now when you go up and down grades that changes yeah. okay so the steeper the grade the closer you need to bring them so the jig has got notches it will tell you the grade that you're on so as it's steeper the grade, you move over a notch, pulls it back another quarter, another quarter, so that they can safely navigate up and down hills because that is another problem. Could you imagine the, with all the post drove, <laughs> every one of them down the hill doesn't fit, right? Oof. So we, we have the tools to, to make that part of the process simple. The gate spaces, um, keeping the gate space, the same tool controls the post width. So it's a three foot, four foot, five foot, six foot gate space. Um, so the, the SpaceX tool, it's very inexpensive. It's a game changer for these guys to be confident in installing the post. It, I think it's a must to train the guys. Yep. I have there an important go. question about that, though. So uh, I know that there are different panel lengths from different manufacturers. Are you making that per manufacturer? Yes. Yep. Right now, the only one we've been making is Barrett. Everyone I've been I've, I've been working with is Barrett, but but it, that tool has to be made to yours. We can do it in eight foot panels, six foot panels, which is another thing I'm working on. It's a very interesting conversation to have is that these posts are so much stronger. Okay. Can we beef up the rail to like an inch and a quarter and three quarter picket, call it a residential, but go on eight foot centers, 25% less posts, 25% faster, 25% less eye posts. And the quotes I got, I'm getting back right now is that, the, it's going to be twenty. It's going to be another twenty five percent less money. So, to to bridge the gap to buy, you know, the I post people are worried about. Well, how much more is it going to cost me? Really, it's about a wash. But if we look at doing eight foot panels, you'll be ahead in actual cost, not even considering the opportunity win. Oh sure. If you put in more fence, because that's you know, there's no way for us to put in more fence a year and then hire another crew, buy another truck. Or get those ninjas building fence faster, right? So, if we can get them building fence faster, then we don't have to buy another truck, and we don't have to go right and put more resources in. We can capitalize on twenty five percent more revenue 
just by going 25% less posts, okay? The driven system alone, we're finding the data showing us at a minimum, the people the first time are seeing a 2.5 sections a man hour, which is about 120 20% faster than our crews or 200% faster than some of the slower crews. But we're seeing numbers as high as six and eight sections a man hour, right? Okay. And I think the ceiling is going to be around for ninjas, 10 and 12 sections a man hour. Um, so you start looking at that. Now you're like, even if this system was a dead cost of the, next, the cost of the eye post alone, and you didn't even talk about the savings of concrete and the savings of shorter posts, nope. the fact that you're going to be able to put in fence at 200, 500, 800% faster and go and be able to put in more fence, it's, it's, just, it's so outrageous when you take the totality of everything available that this, that this iPost system brings to the table. It's almost hard to quantify everything so mm -hmm. much. There's less maintenance costs in your mm -hmm. rigs because you're not hauling around 6,000 pounds of concrete. Yep. There's less liability because you don't have concrete falling off your truck. There's less cleanup in the yard. There's no dirt anywhere. There's that savings alone. Like, well, how much is that worth? The callback. Our number one callback we get is dirt. We don't have yeah. sand. Yeah. Mark Scott. I have this nasty clay and they're all in yesterday's uh, job uh, or the crew we were with the day before they dug and set dry pack. Okay. So we did dry pack before they had to use dig jigs on every single hole. They do this every day. They scoop up all of the dirt. This is what they do. And this is in Nebraska and they put it in piles every day. Okay. Jeez. This was a, every day. Now there are more than just one company that does that. All right. Yeah, okay, sure. that they do. So if we can get, show a system with it was, and it still wasn't perfect, even with all of that effort, there was still mud in the yard. Okay. Go figure. Yeah. The day before. So how much is that worth? Is that, what is that worth? Like, so when people say how much extra does it cost? How, how much less does it cost? It, you're saving a ton of money by going no day. And then a longevity, how long will your guys be able to work for you packing concrete every day and digging holes comparatively to, I mean, it was fun. Yesterday we put in 60 sections in like two hours and we were just having a good time, right? Like mm -hmm. that was a $15,000 job in a couple hours. Like, <laughs> Well, I, I think it's a win all the way around. No matter which angle you look at it from, it's a win. You know, concrete just in general has its own set of problems, whether it be the trash, whether it be the mess of the dust, whether it be, you know, you factor in a certain percentage of loss. Like if you if you buy the concrete and store it, it's going to absorb, absorb more moisture just in the free air. So you're going to end up having hard bags anyway. So you're going to end up losing concrete. There's concrete just by itself is a problem. I, yeah, absolutely. I want to address something here. I haven't told you guys this, but uh, there's a question in there. Uh, if you will pull up Ken Throckmorton's question there. Real yep. Quick. Got it. I, I want to share something with both of you guys, uh, everybody right now. So uh, I came from Nebraska. We got off the job site yesterday about five o'clock or went down meetings at five o'clock and I drove straight here. And actually, I haven't even been home yet. Drove the RV to here to get on this show. Drove all night last night. And while I'm driving, I'm thinking of all this stuff, right? And this 2.5 inch post thing has happened a few times. And we've had a conversation about, well, that's another die, I got extruded. Da, 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 da. I've got it. We are going to make, uh, I'm sending them out next week for a guy that needs uh, 20 of them. We're going to make a HDPE of our our machine out here, a collar. It will fit right over the inch and three quarter. It will fit the two and a half inch post. It's going to cost next to nothing. I'm going to slide right over top. We'll have the have the eye post cut out of it perfectly. Yeah. It'll be a 2.5 inch outside square. Drop that over the eye post, goes to the ground, put a set screw in the eye post, Drop the next one down so it sits on top of that set screw, loading, and now your eye post is locked in. Or your, you can use a two inch eye post inside of a two and a half inch aluminum post. We already know it's stronger than a, exponentially stronger than a two inch. I would imagine it's probably stronger than a two and a half. So I don't think we need to redevelop it and have a whole nother skew. Um, it's a pretty simple fix by by putting that color. We're gonna just try it out. Yeah. Try and see how it goes. So we know. Yeah. Can we talk about so there there is a way currently to do two and a half inch posts, right? We all know that. But the solution to that currently is using uh basically um some uh, I guess we're gonna call them donuts, using some donuts and then using that over a piece inch and five eighths pipe. Now 
the difference between an eye post and a piece of inch and five eighths pipe is exponential. Yeah. Inch and five eighths, even 40 weight pipe is super easy to bend. I can go out there and bend it all day long. Not a problem. Um, not to mention now you just took away that customer that wanted that aluminum fence for whatever reason. Now you put them back in a galvanized steel product instead of aluminum that's weaker than the eye post would be. And now they don't have an all aluminum fence anymore, which is probably what they want. Like in the salt air, that's what they want down here. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not a great solution and it's not adjustable. It's not, I mean, there's, you got the donuts to buy. So not only did you buy the 40 weight pipe, but then you had to pay a bunch of money for the donuts to adapt it. And then you have to get them all down there perfectly square. And I mean, it's a system, it, it works, but is it ideal? It isn't. That's, that's my take on the situation. I think what you're talking about is going to be a much better solution and far and away. And they'll be blue. Keeping with the yeah. They'll be blue. Of course they will. Of course they will. So uh, I was watching, I was watching our video from the guys. Uh, people are talking about how, what if it rotates a little bit? Uh, yeah. Watch the video of ours where we went with Rory Sampson and he had those square posts he was driving. If anybody's seen that and he had this big wrench that he put on there and he twisted them. He so just twisted them. He yesterday twisted we had one that was moving and all we did was take a pipe wrench. Mm -hmm. Same thing you're talking about, but we have pipe wrenches are easy. Just put the pipe wrench on there while we're driving and I can just move that thing. We twisted one yesterday, no problem, right back in line. It was easy. And nice. if it's drove all the way and it won't, you can just twist it when it's bent. It's not going to affect the structural integrity of it all to move it a quarter of an inch so that it's flush and it's back in line with your string. But and, out of the uh, hundreds and hundreds I've driven already, I think I've only had one or two twists. And there's a question in about rocks. If you saw what I drove through in North Carolina, I did a video on the No Dig channel. Holy cow. I mean, there was boulders like this everywhere. And I thought, oh boy, <laughs> and steep hills. This is going to be a challenge. Now, the gas powered driver did not have enough ass uh, to get through all of that. Let's talk, let's talk about drivers uh, because I saw this question earlier come through. But the post. These eye posts are so freaking tough. I mean, we drove them through straight asphalt on a job that was old asphalt. I'm talking cured, hard. We yep. had used a hydraulic. But what blew me away is it just did a little damage to the top of that thing. Wow. So, so here's the question that came up. So um, in most of all the videos, everyone's using the hand drivers, whether they're, they're gas or pneumatic hand drivers. Have either of you guys used equipment mounted drivers? Uh, I haven't yet, but I could go and do it. I guarantee it'll work fine. Yeah, that, the, well, no, I take that back. Hard I take control. That back. I don't. I don't. I, don't I have know. used. I have used ours. Um, to we used our T Rex on our MT eighty five to do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's a little harder to control. Uh, and I think the better question there is: we we get into these conversations about rocks and stuff like that. So. The common thing is these handheld gas drivers and everybody says, well, what if that doesn't drive it? There is a solution to drive every post. I guarantee you. It doesn't matter what it is. There's a solution. It's about how much it's going to cost you to get that post in the ground. It can be core drilled and then driven. I mean, Rory Sampson was another great opportunity in that same video where I was talking about spinning posts. He has incredibly tough ground up there in Scotland. And what did he do? He drilled a one inch hole. Yep. all the way down two feet and then drove these posts straight through the rocks. And he talks about how he got one stuck and pulled the whole rock out. But what it does is it gives that place of that, that post a place to go and fracture and it just starts breaking stuff out of the way. So there's a solution. It's how much you have to spend and how much force it's going to take to make it happen. But you can drive a post successfully in anything. Then well, the other question becomes how deep. Well, so that's a good question too. And so my thought was basically the same. If you can drive it, it probably doesn't matter what you drive it with, right? Is if it works with a hand driver, it'll likely work with equipment. Now, are we bringing equipment into yards, which is a whole conversation? You know, why would we bring a large piece of equipment into a yard when a hand driver would work? But if the answer is, could it work? I don't see why not, right? Let's talk about... Let's talk about the length, uh, Mark. So you brought that up. What is there a general rule of thumb, or is there any sort of, uh, you know, I don't want to say stand, standards. Standards uh, uh, is a strong word, but 
what's the general thought on like for a four foot aluminum fence? How, how deep do you drive these? So we're doing, we're using six foot. Uh, the reason we're using six foot is that gives us three in, which I proved on the video that three in, in our area, even in Florida sand is very adequate, um, way tougher than anything that you could concrete in. So my rule of thumb that I tell people when they ask me that question is, is that I want, uh, what, what a, a minimum of three feet and then two thirds the height of the fence out of the ground. So, okay. Yeah. I just sense. think three feet's a good rule of thumb, but you need to do your own test in your own area and determine what's good. That's uh, really the answer. Is another consideration. That is the answer. I get asked this all the time. How deep? And I'm like, my gosh, guys, just go drive one in your yard, in your territory, in your part of the country and test it. Because yeah. if you take it works for me, it works for Joe, it works for Mark. They're all different soil types and different types of fence have different wind loads and different types of fence are going to have different resources. You got to take everything together. I'll tell you that I'm confident that it will be deeper than you would dig and set. Yes. Yeah. The ACM yeah. standard says technically, and I'm not saying I'm a big proponent. I believe this is to be true, but it just says AS, it says it to be half the height of the uh, fence plus six inches. That's what it says. Right. Uh, but, you know, that may work in most of the country. That might not work everywhere. Yeah. So that's, that's why we did that video here that I think it was out two weeks ago or something like that, where I showed people this is how you do the test in your area, because yeah. I don't know what your soil type is. Yeah. And well, we have, in Wyoming, um, we have this cobblestone ground and you might get it down there three feet. And it just doesn't have that. It doesn't get into those things and it doesn't create enough ground friction. It'll still be loose. It's pushed all the rocks out and the posts in there, but you can take it and pull it right back out. Well, that is not a case where this works well and I wouldn't advise it. Or you've got to go six feet. Eventually it'll hold, but how much do you have to spend to get it to hold? Absolutely. So Ken's got another good question here, guys. So there's a postmaster adapter for gower, for gas powered drivers. Um, is there an option for an eye post adapter there it fits right inside the two and three eighths chuck or a, a wood for a two and three eighths round post but hammer has a chuck that fits specifically the eye post and the advantage is it does let you drive that post as you're going down you can kind of twist it with the handle mm -hmm. that's the only one i know of right now that makes a square adapter to fit the eye post but all of your drivers on the box are going to fit the eye post yeah i think that's a good point of just having the control over it i mean you can feel if it's starting to if it's hitting something and it's starting to twist yeah. on you you can get that immediate feedback whereas just with a round chuck you're probably not going to get that feedback now you should have eyes on the post and you should be paying attention to how it looks when you're driving it but you know we all know that we're also human um but yeah i'm not probably ever going to use that so on the Rhino drivers, which are, we have a fleet of Rhino drivers is what we're using currently. Um, we have the Postmaster Chuck on there and that takes some time to change out. And so I don't want to change yeah. Chucks and it fits in there perfectly and we've never had a problem with it. So I leave the same Chuck on for everything. The same Postmaster Chuck in the Rhino will drive two and three eighths pipe. It'll drive my two inch I-beam. So we never have to change them. Yeah. So we just Perfect. have them set up to do the same. So they work for everything that we're doing down here and, and I just don't want to have to change things out. So. I wouldn't use it even if they gave it to me. And then <laughs> if it gets too tight, the risk you run is if it does mushroom a little bit, yeah. people start talking about problems with them getting stuck. So, well, so that's um, who Dan Hardy had this video of if he was driving with the hammer. So yeah. the hammer chuck is a one piece. So if it does mushroom up in there, you've got to basically take the whole thing apart to try <laughs> to get it out of there. Well, actually, the hammer is easier than the fence pro, right? So the fence pro, if you get a post stuck in a fence pro rhino, you got to take the handles off the top and the bottom and the four bolts is different than the XA. Okay. Okay. We okay. have a bunch of fence pros and XA's now. So the one Mark's talking about for the postmasters and XA, but the fence pro, uh, it's a disaster when it gets stuck in there. The hammer, it's one bolt. It's one bolt. You unloosen it, the whole chuck comes out. It's super easy. The hammer is very advantageous when it does get stuck. The XA, when it gets stuck, it's like four bolts, right? Five bolts, I think. This is the bottom of the adapter on the XA, the Postmaster. Drop adapter. it down. And it, I know. haven't gotten one stuck in the XA yet. Oh, yeah. Well, I have you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. This, I got three in a row stuck. I had three drivers. I was, I was like, this is 
this is the, the ugly truth of it. It happens. And I know when I started driving, I shared my frustrations with Mark a, over a year ago. I said, this is crap. These drivers break all the time and always getting stuck. You got to learn to work around that. Well, recently, last Friday, not this one before last, we went to a job. It's an hour out of town. We have three drivers. First three posts, all three drivers are stuck. So we stuck, stuck the first one. I'm like, give me another driver. Stuck the next one. Give me another driver. Stuck the next one. What had happened was we were driving too thin a wall post for, for the dirt. That's what it was. Okay. I didn't have the adapters for the light duty. I'm, I'm done using the light duty. I'm not <laughs> using it less than schedule 20. You can do yeah. it, but until you can't. And then all of a sudden now it's a nightmare. I had three machines stuck dead in the water because I was trying to cheat and use the flimsy post on a four foot tall little fence. Probably would have been all right. The ground was too hard. Not worth it. Not worth it. Yeah, that's a that's another word of caution is is when you start driving because you're counting on that post to do all your load carrying and stuff. Always go with heavier. Twenty weight is the lightest that we will drive. Absolute lightest we'll drive. Nothing less than twenty weight. Well, and you can incorporate that into into your sales presentation, right? Like because not only are these driven posts and you can get into concrete and dirt, but we're also using heavier duty post, whether we're talking about round or we're talking about the eye post. I think that's absolutely one of the selling points of eye posts is now I'm, you're actually getting a stronger fence, oh. right? And even if you're wanting to use round, I mean, have the car, if we're driving and we drive 40 weight, it's rocky here and we just know we're going to get into it. So it's going to be 40 weight pipe. Uh, but that's part of the sales presentation, right? It's like, we're actually going to upgrade your post to a thicker wall post. And if I was doing this in, you know, if we were doing this at scale, I would just cut off two pieces, right? Here's your thin wall. These are what, this is what everyone else is bidding you. Here's 40 weight. This is what I'm bidding you. Hand them to the customer. What do you think? Right? Same thing with the I-beam. Hand it to the customer. So you get cut off a section of aluminum, two inch aluminum post. One of the post tops you cut off, you know, if you're, or the bottoms, if you're cutting to height anyway. Here's the I-beam. Which one of these two would you like in your yard? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the I beam, right? It's it's more substantial just in the hand. So I think that's part of this discussion too is presenting it as a premium upgrade to your clients as well. Is we are upgrading your fence. It's going to be a better product. I think you and, should charge for it because that adds value. So sure. So, yeah. so you should tell that you should you should on purpose. So I don't know. Tell them you're charging ten dollars a post for this patented superior type product. Add value when you tell the homeowner you're like, uh, it, it's gonna be it's gonna be the same cost. You know, they're like, well, then I just want my concrete. Is there no. value? Yeah. Uh -huh. So for only ten dollars more, I'll give you a fence that's three hundred percent stronger, no dirt. Da da da. You've built value. Now it's not really gonna cost you ten dollars more. If we were to think about this guy, walk through this, I get asked all the time, well, how much more does it cost? I'm just gonna use a rough number of like twenty three bucks on a post because there's different lengths. Okay. Sure. But I think 23 is like the shot. $23 on a post. If you can buy shorter aluminum post, you should be able to save uh, six bucks. Right. I don't know. It's somewhere around six bucks if you sign sure. it. It's on a shorter post. If you're not buying the concrete, we were putting in 80 pounds, maybe a little bit more because we were digging uh, 32 inches deep and eight inch hole. And a two inch, two inch post doesn't kind of take up much room. So we're putting in a little over 80 pounds. So that's a bag and a half or so. For us, that's another eight, uh, seven bucks. Mm -hmm. So there's, there, there's 13 towards the 23 that we're saying it would cost extra right now. How long does it take you to dig a hole and move Bingo. the dirt? How much does it cost you to transport the concrete to the project yeah. back and forth? Right. You're going to find that it might, it might cost you a few dollars more, right? Let's say $10 more, $5 more. But the, the, the fact that you're going to put in, so much more fence exactly versus and less stress and easier it's it's going to be a win-win yeah the increased efficiency makes up the lion's share of that right but to your point earlier that's part of the sales presentation to the client is i will get you a stronger fence i will make you a fence that's repairable i line out all of the pros to the customer and say and it's only 
ten dollars more a post. I can do all of this, and it's only ten dollars more a post. How's that sound? That now you're zero dollars net cost. Right, right, you right. But all the winnings come down to you. Like all the efficiencies are yours to keep. Right. Well, yeah. and also talking about contractors buying in bulk. Also, Mr. Miss Contractor, I'm or Mr. Miss Customer. I'm one of the only licensed contractors for this patented system in the area, and I would love to bring it to your yard. So I have uh, a couple of things. Um, one of the things that I think we need to talk about too is, is people have asked me a couple of times whether or not they should use these with uh, like Ameristar or steel stuff. Okay. Um, can I use this with other, you know, with, with the steel system? And the answer is no, don't do that. Um, I know that there's some systems out there being used now where they're using some zinc coated product or something like that to do something similar to what we're doing. Yeah. The reason you don't want to do that is because you have dissimilar metal corrosion when you have that happen. And so what it does is basically excel the corrosion process. And either if you're doing aluminum over a galvanized steel product, you're going to rot out your galvanized steel product faster or the other way around. If you're using steel, you'll corrode the steel. And so, um, not recommended. Don't do that. That's why we haven't ever recommended that. And you'll never see us recommend doing that. Uh, so be aware of that if you see that going on or if that's your question um, it's not it's not recommended if you were going to do that you would be far better off or we would want to maybe work on a solution for that where you could drive an i-beam yeah. style product for sure. uh, doing um steel product but, yeah so drive a steel for the steel yeah. yeah so for clarity there mark you're saying that works either way right aluminum post and a steel sleeve or a steel driven post with an aluminum sleeve both lead to the dissimilar metal. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. It's not a good idea. Uh, terrible idea to do that. And I know that there's people out there currently doing that. Um, so just be aware that that's a risky run. You're going to rot people's fences out faster and it's going to corrode. And that's why. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about who these posts are available to. Right. So we talked about, I mean, really they're open to the public. Right. So in general, Mr. Or Miss customer can go to the site and they can order them. The where the contractor has the advantage though is the licensing. Is the licensing available to anybody or is it available to contractors? Who's the license available to? Uh, I guess I guess probably the only people I think would probably want to buy a license is somebody that can install enough fence to make it pay. Yeah. Basically, by the time you buy a license, if you buy a license, you get a significant discount, 20 percent. Uh, but you have to then commit to buying full unit quantities. So it's 220 posts per unit. So you can order 220 or 440 or 660. I don't care. Um, and that is also if you commit to the system. By the time you've ordered your first unit, you've paid for your license. But then you're going to significantly lower that freight cost. I mean, it's incredible how much cheaper it is to ship a full bundle of these than to ship 20 or 30 of them. Yeah. yeah, I think the point I was wanting to make is that while they are available to customers, the contractors have, have the advantage of the license, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. through that license, now they can unlock the 20% savings, right? Right, Because there's, there's other brands out there that sell direct to the public, but it's at roughly the same price that they sell to contract not necessarily in this space but in like fittings and accessories so that's that's what grinds a lot of people gets a lot of people ground up about it is that you know well you're selling to the public and you're giving me a two or three percent discount for being a contractor there's no value for me pro providing this to my customer whereas with this system once you buy the license it's a 20 percent discount so you can actually show quite a bit more value to your customer yeah I was going to say too. Uh, check with your manufacturer. We were talking about shorter posts, so the manufacturer we're using here in Florida, we've talked with them, and they're actually making our posts shorter, so that our posts are only extending into the ground about six inches. So we're not buying that. It used to be that we would buy the standard posts and we'd chop them off mm -hmm. and throw that away, which is just a huge waste. And so we finally talked to somebody and said, "Hey, okay, we'll make we'll make the shorter posts for you." So whenever we order now, we have the shorter posts made specifically for our system. So nice. some people will do that and some people won't, but check with your manufacturer. Uh, and, and I think the reason we see people now ordering in smaller quantities is because they're testing the system. They're trying to see if it's going to work. But once you know it works, make the commitment. I uh, don't think you'll be sorry. Well, it's like any other, you know, any other materials that contractors deal with. 
right? Like we don't we don't order wood in job lot quantities. We just know for our company, Ozark Fence, we install so much of it, we'll bring it in by the truckload, right? Because there's there's cost savings in ordering in bulk. This is going to fall along those same lines. Like, I don't blame anyone for ordering job quantity on the first job or two just to make sure it works for their process and just make believers out of them. I'm pretty solid in my belief that after you use it on one or two jobs, it sells itself and you're done, right? So at that point... That's where it makes sense to go all in, get the license, and save 20% on orders moving it's forward. It's not just that the owners or the people in this group are uh, believing it. What happens is when your team members go out and actually get a taste of this and do it, they're going to be begging you to continue with this. I mean, when you get when you get buy-in from your team members on any new product or process or procedure in your company – that is a huge win because we need the buy-in from our team members. And I have seen buy-in from every single person that has seen the system in person. Well, yeah, the installation process alone, I mean, becomes I mean, more the, efficient. Yeah. And it's accessible to more of your team, right? I mean, to use your words, Sean, you're not looking for only ninjas, right? Sorry. Not only ninjas can install this. It's accessible to any of the team members with training, of course, uh, but you can turn most any team member well, that has attention to detail into an aluminum fence builder. You know, we had guys with three months experience yesterday that were only in the fence industry for three months that were driving their own lines and getting them right. So like, what? what that's nothing. Three months and they're capable of doing it. I mean, what are we talking about? This is, this is very easy to train. There's not a whole lot of skill set that's needed to do it. Now, what's interesting, though, I'll tell you this. May not be a lot of skill set needed to do it. It's easy to teach somebody to do. But I'm seeing there's a big difference between somebody learning how to do it and somebody that's really good at it. So you, when you find okay. a fence ninja that is very, very good at just driving the post and knows where to put them in, uh, that's 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 amazing to watch. Now that happens. There's guys that take this to a whole other level. It's easy to get into the base level, common denominator, the lowest common denominator, where everybody can install it. But when you get those guys that are really good at it, it's going in the ground so fast that you can't even pack the material out off the truck fast enough. I I have seen posts every 20 seconds with one person going in the ground in decent soil. It's like, how did that just happen? But he. <laughs> He's not a guy that's chicken level. He's not doing this. He just can feel and sends it with little, no level at all, right? In good soil. So it's something that when the guy gets even better at it, it's amazing how much faster they can get. But yeah, we went and did to uh, 300. Josh Rand was up here the other day and we did 300 and some posts one day with gas pounders, 300 and some. Two and two and three. And that was three and a half feet in the ground. We're, wow. we're, we're working on a project right now. I'm super excited if it lands. Uh, 485 panels of aluminum in a straight line. And I want to see if we can do it in one day with six guys. <laughs> just to see if we're I'm going to get six good guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, get six, not, not, this is, we're not training. We're going to put on a show. Right? You're going to buy a ticket to the show. Okay? <laughs> and see if we can't get this knocked out in eight hours. That's, that's 3,000 feet. Talk about a dream project. 3,000 yeah. foot, one line, all straight. Like, <laughs> pinch me and I'll wake up. And, and it's in Florida, in the sand. That's what I was saying. Nice. Yeah, nice. Let's, let's go. I love it. I love it a let's, lot. Let's yeah. Go. Yeah. I get so jealous, Mark, watching your videos when you're driving posts and the posts just like sent every single one. I, when I when we were watching the review video, I kind of paused and I just had that personal. I was like, I am so jealous of this soil. I mean, I understand like everything has its pros and its cons, its benefits and its drawbacks, but color me jealous on uh, those roots. of you with good soil. Mark says that about my freaking videos. Well, yeah. yours too. That's I don't know how the roots he's got. The roots, uh, the roots are one of the things that we battle the most. It's the, I traded rocks for roots, and roots can be every bit as bad. Yeah. They bounce, right? So yeah. you think that you it just gives. It's flexible, like we talked about earlier. It's flexible, so it's stronger. The root just kind of. Whoop, whoop, whoop. It's like yeah. trying to saw through a loose. It's it's like trying to saw through a loose cable with a reciprocating saw. You'll never get it done. 
It just <laughs> it just goes back and forth, and that's what happens on roots. So we have to pull it out and free bust the root and then send it again. Um, sometimes I, I need to try some stuff with him manual pounders because sometimes that manual pounder has got more force and you can just beat through it. And so I need to tell my guys to try that, just pull that off real quick. Well, the, the hammer is a different tech, a different type of pounder, and it mm -hmm. might do better because it's a very blunt, hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's instead dead blow. Instead of an oscillate and vibrating, it cause that root to vibrate. Uh, Try the. I think you have a hammer. Just try it on a root and see if it does deem better. Yeah, those dead blow hammers transfer a ton of energy, an absolute yeah. ton. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm jealous of both of you to be honest, because so right here in Springfield we've got three gravel pits all around town. Actually, two of them are underground. Like they rent storage. They pull the gravel out. They rent storage in their storage space for all that. It's like it's. So it's solid. Well, how how tall would you say the ceilings are down there in the underground? Twenty foot, something like that. 20, 20, 25 feet tall. So if you think right, you got rock going down about twenty five foot. It's just you just core drill and set to it. Um, yeah. So Brian had said. So this is back when we were talking about driven post. Uh, so they use forty weight as well. Eight foot tall chain link driven post using two inch forty weight. It's probably like six foot centers, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or no wind. Cause... Or no wind, yeah. Yeah, well, Wyoming, if... that thing could be on the ground. Yeah, well, and that's the thing with chain link is you get away with a little bit less wind load there, too. If you don't windscreen, yeah. Yeah, if you don't have yeah, wind Actually, screen, that's, yeah. that, I think that's a common misconception. There is a ton of wind. Anytime you disturb the wind flow, even with the little diamonds, there's a ton of wind load. People don't realize that's there. I was yeah. blown away that aluminum fence blew over, like, I can't. I still can't believe that happened. Same thing. You're disrupting it with the pickets. Just even that disruption at the pickets adds wind load wow. that is crazy. Yeah, yeah. There's actually. I need to see if it's available to the public. So the Chain Link Fence Manufacturers Institute has a wind load guide for Chain Link. It's it's usually provided to like engineers, architects that are providing that are creating. You know these massive projects, right? And they have to take all this into account. I need to check and see if it's if it's available to the public, I'll go ahead and, and push that out through the site. But it's kind of an interesting read. So you're right, Mark, it's not that there's zero wind load, but if we're talking about, you know, on eight foot fence, mm -hmm. we'll do four foot centers if we're doing wood fence. Oh, wow. Right, yeah. so just because there's a ton of wind load. I mean, it's it's a sale. If it's a solid fence, it's sale. Now, if it's shadow box, you get a little bit of pressure relief there, but uh, but, because there's a ton of wind load now not to say chain link has zero wind load but you could typically get away with eight to ten foot centers with heavy wall posts because unless there's privacy slats or privacy screen or that's a whole different ball game uh, but typically you can get away with that with just regular chain link there is wind load but you know to brian's point with 40 weight pipe those are typically sufficient uh, this is an interesting conversation so brian and i talked uh, last week uh, I believe it was on air, uh, just about how talking about standards in general, and to our, to our discussion earlier about how soil difference different is different in different areas, right? So, creating one standard in North Carolina as far as soil depth and or post set depth is going to be different than in Florida is going to be different in Wyoming and California and Indiana, like all the soils different. Uh, so we almost I say. I say we, I am not including myself in this committee. Um, as an industry, we almost need to have some sort of understanding for like a soil condition variance, right? Like here is the minimum standard, but you have to apply whatever this soil variance is. I think it really comes down to so measuring the uh, post itself, not the soil. So whatever we're trying to build, what's acceptable and not acceptable for leverage? Like that's... It needs to be, right, it and needs that can be the standard. The standard should be it needs to be deep enough to withhold this, right? And you've yeah. got to figure that out. And here's what we found out in this soil, and this soil, and this soil, and this soil. But if you tell them, you know, hey, in Arkansas, you have to do this way. Well, that's, there's a, there's different soil all over the country in every different state. Well, but and this is to Mark's point earlier in that they've got more of a cobblestone type soil up in Wyoming. So what works in Florida doesn't necessarily work in Wyoming in terms nope. of depth, in terms of width of the hole, and in terms of general construction, right? So 
when we're creating standards with a broad brush and we're saying this is the standard for the United States, I think that I think there's a bit of a failure there to understand that conditions vary condition in our city soil conditions vary right they can vary within a four or five mile radius of each other much less across the united states and then the conversation is we need to make sure the fo the footer is greater than the post itself and that's it there's no sense in overkilling this footer and driving a post down six feet in the ground when it's going to kink with 100 pounds of force anyways Right. Well, like you said, Ooh, the point of failure is at the concrete. Yeah. Well, it's going to be relative to the type of fence, but I mean, sure. We can't, we can't just say, hey, if you drive a post to six foot tall, it's going to be this deep. What kind of post? What kind of fence? What kind of wind load? What, what are we talking about? All those things are going to be have to take into play so that we have something. Otherwise, you end up with one overkill standard that guys are not going to hit because it's impractical for what sure. they're building. They're building a three foot tall aluminum fence. Well, yeah, we don't need a four foot deep footer. Yep. What are we talking yep. about? Why does it need to be four foot deep in a 12 inch round hole? <laughs> no sense. So there is a standard uh, in the ASTM on chain link for driven driven post too. Just so anybody wants to know if you pull up the manual. I don't remember what it is. I want to say it's yes. it's whatever the depth is normally plus six inches. Uh, I don't know. There's some wording in there, but it usually ends up being basically a three foot minimum. Um, for a depth maybe you can get away uh, but it's yeah. out there tony thornton knows knows it by heart um he has a copy of it if you have an astm manual you can look it up but there is specs for driven fence so it's not like astm is unaware that this is going on and has said no way no way ever so no no i, I think i think my point was just that that spec though needs to have some sort of understanding for ground Con the ground variance, right? The condi ground condition, soil condition variance. Because to your point earlier, if you drove a post in Wyoming three feet in the cobblestone type soil, is that's not going to be a solid solution. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But but if you're core drilling into solid stone, good luck getting 36 inches, right? Or 30 inches if you're setting. Good luck getting 30 inches. But I think they're just. I think Brian's point is there just needs to be some. We as an industry probably, the fencing industry probably needs to create our own set of, I don't know about standards, but our own understanding of here's what here's how soil conditions affect the you know, here's a base standard and then here's how you modify it based on soil conditions or it just it needs to be built by fencers, period. Okay. We right. our our standards right now are, we're not built by guys out there doing the doing out there doing the building the fence. It didn't happen. Yeah. That's yep. what we need. We Absolutely. need to keep sharing information, keep testing. No different than what Mark's doing and I'm doing. There'll be more of us to, where the rubber meets the road, go out there and test it, analyze it, figure it out, what works, what doesn't work, and share that and create our own set of standards that make sense for our industry. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so Jeff's got a decent point too, though. So say we wave a magic wand and we create these standards, but – what is the point of the standards if you've got contractors they don't adhere to the standards anyway you know mm -hmm. and they're, the, the, it, they're suggested this right is, and when it, when the when it comes down to is when there's a failure and the contractor knew what the standard was and chose not to then that contractor is at fault that's all so that's so that's the point is the the fault the end of that question was about enforcement there's there's not enforce no one's measuring holes the customer's enforcing it. Right. Well, yeah. and you're going to assume liability. That's yeah. right. So if you build it out of standards, out of spec, it's just like anything. I mean, go build a commercial project project out of spec. If the inspector doesn't get, you know, if the project doesn't have a, a quality inspector, quality assurance person, and that product fails and they find that you built it outside of specification for the project, you're liable for it. But you those get specifications to, are whatever you choose before you start the work. Right. There's not like a golden rule that everything has to be built this way. It's just people reference ASTM standard and yeah. say, I want you to build this ASTM standard because it's the only standard we have. I like to see us have another set of standards built by us and the contractor can choose. I want Mark Olson standard. Okay, great. We're going to build this a Mark Olson standard. No, I want sure. ASTM standard. Well, I'm sorry. We don't do ASTM standard. So yeah. I, only, I only build the Mark Olson standard. Period. That's what I do. That's what I know works. That's what I put my name on. Yep. And you you can you can do 
contracting bid in industrial work we're just telling them this is the standard we, we this is it this is our standard if you don't like it we'll go somewhere else yeah well and you just even on these projects like so these large commercial projects i think a lot of guys think that they have to bid it exactly as it's spec'd right they said well it's in the specification manual so i have to build it this way like well you don't i mean once you once you bid it and accept it you do right you once you sign yeah. on the dotted line you absolutely do but you missed a whole period before of that to ask for clarification for ask That's for a variance thing. for whatever you yeah. know wherever you want to insert it in that process but you can absolutely say guys this is i mean how often do you guys see on commercial projects do you guys see and the, the plans don't meet the specifications hmm. right the plans call for one way and the specification calls for something else because they're just pulling this stuff from so that's what i'm saying Ran they, they, not random but from different publications that sort of thing it happens it happens probably more often than we think with these these things are being specced out by people who don't know anything about fence oh yeah oh 100 percent. And here we are as professional contractors that know better like oh that's the way it's spec no bullshit. it's time to start educating them and say i'm sorry this is ridiculous you look like an idiot this is how we build this up a fence and this is the spec you said it's priced using this spec. If you accept my bid with that spec, then we have a happy in relationship. If you don't, you choose whether you're going to follow that inferior spec or not, or yeah. or overkill spec. Sometimes it's completely overkill. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a whole process before the bid goes in of request for information or request for clarification, depending on who you're dealing with. And that's where you establish all of that. But anyway uh guys we are a little over an hour so we talked about that they can find these posts at swi the the no dig i post system uh you can find those at swi which is in in the description of this if you're watching on youtube uh Brayden, you want to drop that in the comments so that way if they're watching facebook or linkedin they'll find they'll see it swifence.com if you go to swiwyoming.com you'll get the install side and there's a link there but it's a little harder to find so okay yeah we just dropped the uh the swi link there in the comments so if you're no matter where you're watching you should see it right now um for more information you can reach out uh really to any of us um and and uh yeah let us know guys any closing remarks any closing uh, thoughts on this um digging's dead that's all i have to say <laughs> I, i'm done digging holes man and, and I, i'm ready to set, set some own some poles that's what we're calling now no longer do we own holes now we own poles yeah there you <laughs> go yeah, and for it guys if you're watching this and you want some more information just on no dig in general there's a whole facebook group just for the no dig movement are we calling it a movement maybe or it's or really the no dig process Yep. We're late to the party, really. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there's a whole Facebook group devoted to this. We've got a great group of guys in there that are basically producing content daily of them practically installing it. It's not theory. It's not, I think this is how it works. It is, this is how it's working right now in the field. Um, you can also check out YouTube videos. You can follow Mark's channel. Uh, he's putting out a lot. Mark, how many videos do you have on it now? Four, I think? Mm, I don't know. We several i guess yeah we just we just committed to the system and i think that's what's really kind of helped we uh, uh, it's not like we invented the system we haven't invented right. no dig it's been around forever but we're the ones that's like hey we're just going to take this mainstream yeah this needs Brain to become to mainstream it's just not been accepted in a residential world yeah. i was one of the ones fighting it in the beginning saying that's not practical you're not going to do that in every backyard what about this what about this what about this what about this uh, yeah, and now I'm telling you that all those little things that we're always worried about, we can work through them. You can work through them. There's a solution for them. Uh, I'll also say that um, so our our Mr. Fitz Academy training that we normally do is traditionally about dry packing, dig, and set. Mm -hmm. Since madness, there wasn't no holes dug. We pounded everything. Okay, so it was two days of no no dig training. May mayhem coming up May 11th and 12th, Thursday and Friday. Is going to again be no dig. The demand is so much about no dig. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it again uh, at the in, in May 11th and May 12th, whatever Thursday, Friday is, in Evansville. We'll be doing no dig vinyl, aluminum, for sure, and we possibly might be doing wood as well. So, if you want to come and see it in person, 
that's another opportunity. Nice. There's so much content being created and there's so much demand on our YouTube channel. Your customers are going to be asking for this. So if you're not doing it now, you probably want to learn. So, so that's a fair point. I meant to bring it up earlier. I'm glad you said that. So you create demand in your market for it, right? And then you have the license. You're the person that can, that can provide it. We did the same thing with Postmaster Post back in the day. No one in our area was installing Postmaster Post for wood fence. Like it just, no one saw the value in it. Well, I, th I thought, well, I'd sure like to stop having to replace rotted posts. So let's shoot a video. We shot a video where I said, hey, you know, Mr. Miss Customer, just like we upgrade your fence from pine materials to steel uh, to cedar materials, now we're upgrading your post from wood post to steel post. Uh, and it's not just us. These are available to everyone. So when you're having your next fence installed, be sure to ask for the Postmaster Post to make sure your fence lasts a lifetime or something to that effect. Now, at the time, we were the only ones offering Postmaster Post. So they started calling around asking for Postmasters. We happen to be the guys that did this, right? So the same thing can be done in any market. Hey, you know, we're improving the aluminum fence that's installed in your backyard by offering the iPost. So whether you choose our company or whomever, you wanted to ask for the iPost to make sure that your fence lasts a lifetime or whatever, whatever the saying you want to go with. Knowing that you are the licensed contractor in the area, right? You are the person that's on the iPost. So you can you can create demand in your market pretty easily by a video or a better yet a series of videos and showing the installation method and that sort of thing. Uh, it's really not hard to sell it. Yeah. No. We haven't we, we we don't get every job, but boy, we saw a ton of them. Well, you, you don't want every job. No. Right. Like that's no one can handle every job in any market. You know, so you don't want everyone. You want the ones that make sense for your company that fit your business model, that fit where you want to go with the business and how you want to install fence. So you adopt it, you offer it, and those that realize the value, then you enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're selecting our customers. They're not selecting us. Sure. Absolutely. You, you pick your ideal customer and your ideal project. And then it makes you enjoy work a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. yep. so. Well, guys, I appreciate your time. Those of you watching at home or I guess wherever you're from, wherever you are or wherever you're listening from, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you being so giving of your time. If you do have questions, drop them in the comments below. Even after this live is done, we'll still monitor the questions and we'll still get back to you uh, as quickly as possible with answers. But for now, I'm Joe Evers, the fence expert, reminding you, the good fences make good neighbors. I'll see you next week. See you guys. See ya.